Hello and welcome to today's session. I have joining us today Professor Rohan Samarajiva, the founding chair of Learn Asia and the senior advisor of the Advocata Institute, and Dr. Harsha De Silva, member of parliament. Today we will be discussing the common minimum program. <clears throat> so if I could just start off uh, with a brief, brief overview of the program, Professor and Doctor, over to you. Well, uh, I guess when I talk about the common minimum program, I have to talk about the national movement for social justice, of which I have been fully engaged since uh, 2019 or let's say 2020. And I was reminded by uh, Facebook while I was seated uh, here at the, the Reform Now conference that uh, last year around this time, uh, August 10th, I had had uh, Premachand Rathgorala, who was the lead speaker in the morning, uh, and uh, Subhashini Abhisingha uh, from Verite Research, and Umesh Moramudali, who's uh, one of our bright young economists, uh, on a Zoom, uh, what it described as the fourth uh, specialized economic uh, webinars that uh, the NMSJ was running. And why I brought that up is that that's how long ago we started work on the common minimum program. Because uh, I'm, I'm not saying I'm the only one, but I saw this disaster coming from 2020. And I was using the term Pera Novi Viru Arbudeak, an unprecedented crisis in pretty much all my media interactions. And my thesis was that when you have a crisis of this proportions coming at you, you need a sort of a, a common cabinet, a common approach, uh, and so on. And at the minimum, you need a common program. Now, given that I know how fractious and dysfunctional our political system in this country is, how everybody's jockeying to see how they can win the next election or do various things like that, uh, I thought what we need is a common Yes, but a minimum, because I couldn't get everybody to agree on everything, but a common minimum program. And we looked at, uh, you know, the Indian uh, predecessors to this uh, 2004, I believe there was a comprehensive common minimum program and a few other countries. Uh, that sounds like a good term. Let's go. So we built up the knowledge because I absolutely abhor what is going on in this country as policy proposals, where a bunch of guys over a drink or something come up with some ideas, that goes into an election manifesto, and then that becomes the country's overriding policy pro policy position. Mm -hmm. So I always try to get evidence, get differing viewpoints into the conversation for formulating policy. And that's how we started on the common minimum program. Um, so I spent a little bit of time on the origins. I'll now fast forward. By February of 2022, mm -hmm. we put out a document which had various components. Uh, and then by June, we had analyzed eight different uh, policy proposals that were coming because, you know, I mean, we were not the only ones who had this bright idea. Uh, the Hatalist Suno Balakai, the 43 Brigade, uh, Advocata itself had a seven point program, etc. Bar Association came up with some ideas. We took what we were trying to find what was common in, the, in these programs. Uh, then we put it out uh, to, took it to uh, a group of economists in honor of the role uh, that the youth have played in our current uh, transformations. I made sure that most of the economists were young, but I didn't discriminate against the old. Um, but usually we discriminate against the young. So I, I made sure there were enough young people there. We also ran it past a group of uh, business leaders, including, for example, the, C the CEOs of Kiehl's and uh, Expo Lanka and so on. And uh, we came up with a document by the 4th of June, which we shared with the prime minister in early uh, the Prime Minister at the time, 
Minister Ranil Vikram Singh, the current president, uh, in early June. And uh, we published it. Uh, we had a press conference. We tried to get people to focus on it. I was very happy that uh, my friend Harsha took it very seriously and engaged it, uh, with it in an extremely substantive way. But uh, I'll leave that story to him. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so <coughs> I'll pick up from where Rohan left off. Uh, we have been looking at uh, the crisis and obviously the way out of the crisis for a long period of time. And I think, Rohan, maybe it would have been around the same time. Partly and I also participated in one of your Zoom sessions um, uh, right. on that. Mm -hmm. I think it was before uh, Chandra's one, perhaps, maybe. Yeah. I can't recall. Because that was number four. So That's right. I think we were number three or something like that. <laughs> And so, so, and in fact, right throughout, I was working with mm -hmm. Professor uh, Premachandra Tuparala. Uh, you know, started with a long 50 page document, brought it down to 20 pages, brought it back up to 25 pages, you know, trying to shave here, cut there. But essentially, was uh, planning on some, uh, 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 you know, a structure you know, a plan, a program uh, to get this country out of the crisis mm -hmm. uh, if ever we had the opportunity to do so. So we were getting ready. And then when uh, we decided to uh, try and create an all-party government or a multi-party government, uh, what we thought was, okay, fine, then what is the common minimum program? Mm -hmm. And then obviously, you know, we took what Rohan had uh, uh, developed uh, at the NMSJ and uh, we incorporated that. In fact, I called Rohan and said, uh, can we incorporate what we have with what you have? Um, and uh, uh, Advocata actually helped us do that. Rohan's people also at Learn Asia helped us do that. And we created one document um, because it was so similar, our thinking and what this uh, common minimum program looked like at the time, this, uh, the slides actually. And uh, uh, then uh, what uh, we did uh, was I converted it into a, 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 a another document uh, which gave more context than the set of slides uh, incorporated what we have been thinking about what needs to be done. I mean, it is about reform, certainly. And, uh, and we uh, took it uh, to the different parties because we set up a little committee uh, for the so-called uh, all party, multi party government, and uh, I was asked to chair the economic subcommittee, and somebody else chair the political mm -hmm. subcommittee. So, in the economic uh, common minimum program, I presented this to the various political parties, uh, some of whom had already by that time uh, proposed various programs, and Rohan and his team uh, had taken those into consideration, while some others had not. So it was an interesting uh, uh, few meetings at a parliament uh, in our committee rooms and uh, people like uh, Venerable uh, Ratana Thero uh, originally and uh, Vasudeva Nanayakar, people like that who were completely opposed to the uh, three letters IMF, uh, you know, slowly did come around. You know, I'm not saying Vasu totally agreed, but uh, his group, the 11 party group uh, that is called the 11 party group, uh, did agree uh, in general uh, to what was uh, included in that document. So that is how uh, we were able to get a sign off uh, from everyone except uh, the Sri Lanka Podu Paramunas uh, present, or it's also fractured. Uh, the one that is with uh, the president at the time, or, or, or I mean right now, but given uh, the president himself is completely uh, on board uh, with this program, uh, I'm assuming that his group is also on board with the program. So if that group is on board with the program, if the rest of us are on board with the program, then we have an unprecedented situation where everyone is in agreement uh, to, to sort of implement uh, this common minimum program on economic reform. So that is why I keep pushing 
you know, uh, for um, a, a inclusive government for an interim period of time to get these reforms done. Thank you, Doctor, and thank you, Professor, for the origin story of the Common Minimum Program, um, which, like you both mentioned, is drawing on the expertise and the views of many individuals and organizations. Um, since we talked a lot about where this, this program came from, I would like to dig in a little bit deeper onto the sections. Like you mentioned, there are eight sections that the program kind of focuses on. This includes um, revenue consolidation, the public sector and SOE management, social safety nets, just to name a few. Um, Professor, if I could just ask you to give a brief overview of the important points of this uh, program, just to give an understanding of what exactly this program consists of. Well, there are the eight areas. I think Karcha's one probably has uh, one or two more. Um, <clears throat> you know, some of this uh, macroeconomic stabilization and so on, I don't think we need to get into great detail. Mm -hmm. uh, if I were to go through all eight in detail, it will take uh, much <laughs> longer than the time that we have. So what I'd like to do is to sort of pick a few. Yes. Right. One of the things that we found um, common across all the, 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 the programs or proposals that we looked at was there was a great, there was interest in, I mean, I'll just contrast it, right? Social safety net, everybody agreed, we need to have something. Mm -hmm. Not everybody agreed that we should cut government expenditures. Mm -hmm. I mean, most did, but not everybody did. So I'll talk about sort of these, these two. So social safety net, I had pushed uh, it very hard. Um, I think it would have been probably even before uh, August that we had that discussion. Um, partly because I, uh, again, what I was looking for were things that we could quickly get done. You know, this long term reform proposals. This is not really about that. This is about things that can be achieved in 2022, things that can be achieved in 2023 and things that can be completed by 2024, right? If yeah. we thought there, there were things that couldn't be done within that time frame, I was walking away from that, right? Yeah. It's really about, uh, I think the header of our document was common minimum program for economic recovery, mm -hmm. not for you know, everything under the sun, yeah. right? Uh, so uh, with the, with the uh, safety net, what I knew was that in 2002, the government had enacted a law called the Welfare Benefits Board Law. Then nothing had happened uh, during the Rajapaksa regimes. Uh, 2017, this had been sort of activated. Board had been appointed. Uh, and there were efforts to get a consolidated database. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a sort of a guilt factor. I'm a guy, one of these guys who's driven by guilt, uh, which is I couldn't get that database completed right i had only 20 months the government brought me only to you know clean up a mess uh, so i i wasn't there at the beginning the mess had been created even with regard to the database and now i am scrambling to try to uh, get this mess cleared and we have the cons anti constitutional coup we have the easter bombings and then we have an election so i couldn't get it done right uh, so i was thinking okay now that's the one 43 things under a common uh, uh, the welfare benefits board we consolidated we got the database in yeah. we'll get this done right one uh, then we were looking at the 2019 gazette which said who is eligible and mm. who's not and then we were saying okay but and these are things that are in the program right mm. uh, how do we talk about eligibility how do yeah. we talk about mistargeting so while this is going on, while we flag the social safety net as a topic, I've got my team at Learn Asia volunteering, volunteering, right, outside their mm. paid job to collect data on this, okay. uh, trying to figure out how do we get cash transfers in, how do we deal with people who are sort of middle class people or lower middle class people who are suddenly crashing, mm -hmm. no job, no income, uh, for no fault of this. I mean, like, Victims of disaster, except man made, human made, politician made, disaster, right? Not natural disaster. So, that one to us was very important and it has made it, to, it appeared important to everybody else. It's a critical component of the. Now, you can talk about that and mm -hmm. say, yeah, but where's the money coming? Mm -hmm. Right? 
மனிதன் கொடுக்காது சம்வே யூ நோ ஐ மீன் டெம்பரரி வேர்ல் பேங்க் கிரெடிட்ஸ் ஆர் சம்திங் கேன் பி ரீபர்பஸ்ட் அண்ட் गिवन ஃபார் திஸ் கைண்ட் ஆஃப் பட் ஐ மீன் தட்ஸ் ஆல் டெம்பரரி வி नीड टू லுக் आफ्टर आवर ओन हाउस ஆ ஹவ் டு வி ரேஸ் ரெவென்யூ ஹவ் டு வி கட் எக்ஸ்பெண்டிச்சர்ஸ் நவ ஐ ஜஸ்ட் गिव யூ ஒன் எக்ஸாம்பிள் ரைட் ஐ மீன் we have this samurdhi program which we really need to sort of completely restructure but 25% of the total allocation for samurdhi is goes to support 25000 employees mm-hmm. and the samurdhi people on average are getting 2500 rupees now it's higher but you know they were getting 2500 rupees and these employees were getting 50000 on average mm-hmm. right again so i had in my document uh, let's get rid of the samurdhi mm-hmm. thing mm-hmm. right i mean that's a that's a saving mm-hmm. uh, i saved 25% of this and i put it back into to to actually giving yeah. giving these people money because i can do it through cash transfers into their banks into mobile payments etc mm-hmm. now when i went through the common minimum program process and i talked to the economists and i talked to the business leaders guess what is moved out of the program the abolition of the samurdhi department but you know that's life mm-hmm. right that's how it works right. if i am going to get everything i want it won't be a common program it will be my right. program mm-hmm. i don't want my program okay. i have atharim i give up i mm-hmm. detach myself mm-hmm. from this it's a common thing okay. yeah. thank you professor for that very insightful answer Uh, good morning Dr. Harshay if there's any points from the program that you would like to highlight um yeah i mean i'll just say finally what uh, uh, is in the common minimum program from yeah. where where yeah. he uh, you know atharin uh, his <laughs> uh, his original uh, idea so i mean when we um, talk about um, you know the safety net what we had to try and explain to some of the uh, politicians uh, who are not willing to um, agree on uh, uh, energy pricing reforms for instance um, it was a tough one uh, because um, a lot of people believe that the subsidies must be granted to the supplier um, and that uh, changing that would somehow be uh, you know taking away uh, from the poor who deserve uh, subsidies um, and uh, we used um, a number of examples one of which uh, is i told these guys look if you go to the flower road shed and pump uh, you know 100 liters of diesel you know the government is going to give you something like a 30000 rupee subsidy right uh whereas the guy <laughs> getting it uh you know into his three wheeler is only getting you know 1000 uh, rupees or what have you uh, and is that equitable right and then uh, we i think to an extent uh, were able to convince some of these political parties who are not willing uh, to agree Uh, to cost effective prices in energy uh to finally say okay let's uh, let's do that uh, so because you know like someone said you know politicians who want to get elected and get reelected uh, so how do you make sure that uh, the politician does not feel that by doing these reforms his chances of getting reelected is going to be completely mm-hmm. sort of diminished yeah. so uh, and and i think political parties for a long period of time you know has been as you all know you know welfare based and give things away uh, and finally they have come to realize that uh, that model uh, can is no longer sustainable right uh, like the president said yesterday in his keynote mm-hmm. uh, we have to going for a new economic model the old model um, will no longer uh, serve us right so 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 we have to as politicians you know take this common minimum program and explain it in simple words 
to people who across the social uh, uh, you know classes in this country understand uh, why we need to do this so that's really um, you see what uh, how we going to implement uh, this common minimum program thank you dr ashan i completely agree with, with the point that you made um in terms of the common minimum program obviously any program in terms of policy or reform does not have it's not a do all and end all mechanism there are certain um issues maybe with time frames etc and there have been um, what would you say to the criticisms that have been kind of given in regard to the common minimum program if it's uh, do taxes really need to be increased at a time like this or is it not enough taxes um so the criticisms to these programs is there anything that you would like to kind of say to those things well i haven't had to yeah ha- i'm so i was kind of surprised i have had a lot of criticisms mm-hmm. i had some people who i i even doubt whether they read it saying that we had not prioritized increases in taxes mm-hmm. so i said have you actually read this document mm-hmm. <laughs> because it, it talks about taxes quite a lot and mm-hmm. and even mm-hmm. things that I, i personally am still uncomfortable with as i said you know common minimum program shouldn't uh, it once said about uh, you know me as a regulator he said i made everybody unhappy now i've got this uh, common minimum program which is making even me unhappy so there is some stuff about non tax revenues being mm. increased right uh, i sort of don't like the government as a monopoly service provider mm-hmm. just arbitrarily raising taxes but we need to raise them. so those things are there so so i i actually i, I responded to that criticism and i said look it's yeah. we are really un- we under we, we, we do say taxes need yeah. to be raised the fact that it's on the second page instead of the first page i mean it's not material there was another criticism which was made which i i i take a lot more seriously uh, which is why is it focused on just the recovery mm-hmm. why not look at the sort of how do we create a new economic model so to speak uh, if the old model which was based on government exports and such and such uh, has run its course and they do run their courses these these models mm-hmm. is this does this include the elements of a sort of a the next stage of sri lanka's growth uh, model and i i i think that's a reasonable uh, response uh, my feeling is that one has to recover you know if you metaphorically think we are inside some kind of big hole we need to climb out before we start building so my focus is on climbing out and within my time frame is basically about 2 years within about 2 years we need to climb out and somewhere there through this process that we have gone through maybe we would have uh, got enough consensus got enough discussion about what the new model is uh maybe i'm wrong maybe it should be all done together mm-hmm. it's a judgment call mm-hmm. um also another kind of question that i want <coughs> to raise is in regard to a lot of these policies that you're saying and i think you keep saying a lot of these over time not only now but during a crisis and the imf like you mentioned earlier in the last program uh they've tried to attempt a lot of these in the past especially revenue consolidation which is in the program um but it faces many challenges and i'm sure it would still continue to face many challenges so is there any way to, to plan to overcome this given that this is an unprecedented crisis that we're in um and like it's even more of an economic challenge than we've ever experienced you see today's um, uh presentation by uh, sandra prema sandra tukora should have opened the eyes of a lot of people uh because you see we need to create jobs you know at the end of the day mm-hmm. uh you know folks need to earn a living right where are these jobs going to come from and when murtaza asked uh, chandra about the remittances what he said is it sometimes want to cry because why are we sending our people 
uh, to work overseas. We are not sending. I actually disagree with that yeah. moral on that. Yes. Nobody is sending anybody. Mm. People are taking voluntary decisions about how to better their lives. Yes. I don't think any economist or anybody has any right to interfere in that. Yeah. So the thing is, it's all about incentives, right? So the incentive to go versus the incentive to stay. So essentially, uh, the economy has been growing uh, for the last so many years. Post-war era, he showed the numbers, Rohan, uh, on debt-fueled, non-tradable sectors. So construction, you know, uh, apartment buildings, roads, and <clears throat> you borrow in dollars and you are earning in rupees so therefore you are stuck right so <clears throat> what we need to do obviously is to start earning dollars so the investments that need to come in somehow uh, has to be incentivized to go into tradable sectors right so to have a sustainable economy to grow at 10 percent if we need to get out of this hole and build new structures then we need uh, that structural shift in the economy right if that structural shift happens then the jobs that will get created would certainly be ones that would incentivize people to find jobs here or right? come back yeah or come back <laughs> right <clears throat> so this is fundamental mm -hmm. Right, every investment dollar is not the same. Investment dollar that goes into building a road, obviously, it will have multiplier effects because markets will get connected to rural farmlands and things like that. True, uh, but uh, because it is in the tradable sector, you are creating disincentives uh, uh, for uh, you know the kind of jobs that need to get. Uh, created in the tradable sector. So this is something in, in policy, uh, Rohan, I mean, when, when, for instance, the BOI needs to work properly, BOI needs to be revamped, uh, you know, so the, 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 <laughs> the ease of bringing FDIs, <laughs> you know, <laughs> gets much, much, much more, uh, you know, it's much more efficient than it is now and so on. But uh, the point is that there has to be this differentiation uh, that got uh, to be made. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Um, also, Professor, if you could ask in terms of public sector and SOE management, which I believe is the, sec the fourth section that the program kind of looks at. So there are many reform steps that are mentioned. There's privatization, liberalization, hard budget constraints, reorganizing. So is there a certain order of priority that you see for these reforms or are they being executed to ensure that the largest gains are felt first? How does how do you see it kind of ideally playing out? Well, <coughs> words are cheap. Actions <laughs> are not. That's my thing. So what we need is communicative action. So communicative action doesn't mean passing laws. It is, but it's not enough. Uh, it's not enough to sort of then set up a board and do various things. Mm. I think more important is that we need to show something serious. That's why I uh, have been, well, actually, I've been pushing it for the last 15 years. But uh, with increasing intensity, I have been pushing the privatization of Sri Lanka, Sri Lankan Airlines, mm -hmm. because I think that's a communicative act. In the same way that in 2002, December, uh, the reform government that I had the privilege of working for at that time uh, communicated to the telecom sector and to, to all uh, investors that Sri Lanka was on a different track by uh, reducing government ownership in Sri Lanka Telecom to below 50% through an IPO, uh, which uh, had failed several times before and we finally got it. That's a communicative act. So I'm looking for a communicative act okay. uh, while we do the other things, because yeah. I think credibility is very, very important in this game. So uh, I think the, the, the whole point with uh, the state-owned enterprises, I mean, <laughs> I've actually headed a government-owned company 
and I've sort of seen the constraints that we all work under. But we need to get a signal that when the government says there are hard budget constraints, they are hard, right? I, nobody takes hard government claims that you know there's no more money. Nobody takes it seriously. So I think we need to 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 address those. Uh, they have to be done in parallel, but I would prioritize communicative actions. Prashanshi Zain, do you would like to add to that, or would you would you kind of go on the same boat as Professor Iran said? No, I mean you have to feel the benefits of reform. You see, yeah. I mean for people to people to agree uh, to continue to sort of do something, uh, those rewards must be felt, right? And you know to reform. Politically, it's going to you know, the, these benefits will not accrue to people, you know, yeah. far, immediately. immediately, right? Yeah. So, so, so if you look at um, you know some of the success stories, mm. uh, you know there have been governments that have stayed on uh, for quite some period of time. This question about uh, you know periodic elections and uh, and I don't want to get into this whole debate uh, about uh, you know the the whole concept of democracy mm -hmm. and reform. You know, people do question, right? Uh, because with a, a two and a half year uh, window, because currently according to the constitution, parliament can be dissolved in two and a half years mm -hmm. or a five year window. So whether it is in expenditure rationalization or whether it is in uh, you know increasing tax revenues or whether it is in cutting out subsidies whichever uh, type of reform that you have to really implement um, unless like Rohan says you know you communicate it properly in such a way uh, that uh, people are able to I guess you know appreciate uh, the but the difference there, Harsha, was that you see the, the SLT uh, IPO yeah. wasn't communicating to people, to mm. the general public. Mm. It was communicating to investors and, and uh, you know, those kinds of sort of players. Yeah. Uh, we didn't. That reform government failed in communicating to people. That yeah. is why it got kicked out. Precisely. Right? You know, so, so that is what I'm saying. You know, communication has to happen before reforms take place. Mm -hmm. Now, for instance, I think in Egypt, uh, when the, the 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 subsidy structures were completely turned on its head, mm. right? And when it went from subsidizing energy prices to a cash transfer system to the needy, uh, I believe the cash transfer system started first, and then the uh, the subsidy removal happened. So the sequencing of it. Uh, was important so that people felt, look, we are not going to be out of pocket. We are actually going to benefit from these types of reforms. So that is why I said, you know, you have to feel uh, that uh, these things are good for you, right? So, so, so this is a tough one, yeah. right? And and particularly in Sri Lanka, where we are now with, uh, you know, eight percent sub eight uh, percent revenue to GDP. There is absolutely no fiscal space, mm. right? So it is going to be extremely tough, Rohan. I think I um, uh, to undertake and implement these reforms uh, in any sustainable manner. So you see, we did one of the reforms that uh, was completed by that uh, reform government that I referred to was that we ended the international telecom exclusivity. Prices came down. In one day, an international call, which was 75 rupees a minute, became 10 rupees a minute. And then it went down to two, and now nobody even knows, nobody cares, right? Mm -hmm. You make international calls without thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, but that kind of thing that, that people can feel, very difficult for us to give. Because, I mean, just because we prioritize Sri Lankan airlines, I had a proposal. Uh, I think this was somewhere when Mr. Mahindraj Bhatsa had printed that uh, banknote of his with his picture and the port to a symbol at the bottom. So I was saying that a 500 rupee note or? Thousand, no? Thousand rupee. I think so. So I had a picture of that and I was saying the amount of money we are losing in uh, on uh, 
on Sri Lankan is such mm. that if we take that money, mm. one year's money, and in agreeing as a response to you know to get the people's agreement mm. to get rid of this mm. white elephant, we give everybody cash. Every man, woman, and child in this country, mm. 20 million people, mm. 1,000 rupees each, with that blue pro party propaganda mm. banknote, we would still be ahead. Mm. Right? Now, that's the immediate benefit that people will get because, you know, right now, Sri Lanka gives no immediate benefit to anybody. Yet, we have Jati Kabimane, and, you know, we need a national airline, and we one day maybe I will be able to read, eat rice and curry on a on a on a on a, on a airplane. On a, I don't know what, because I think the 2015 2019 government, in my view, was a dismal failure in terms of reforming state-owned enterprises. And when I asked in a public setting, uh, Iran Vikramaratna, a friend of ours, who was a minister in charge of that disinvestment kind of portfolio with Kabir Hashim. And he said, you know, we are trying to figure out how much this national esteem or pride is worth to our people, right? Mm -hmm. And I was saying, here, give a, give a banknote, 1,000 rupees for every man, woman, and child, and then mm -hmm. you know what the value of uh, mm -hmm. esteem. That's the challenge that we have. We have to come up with some crazy ideas yeah. to communicate this stuff. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Doctor. Um, I think uh, since we're nearing to the end of this discussion, um, was there any, is there like a sentence that you would like to kind of convey, to convey this, the importance of not only this program or to let people know the, the importance that this situation that we're in isn't going to solve itself overnight. These policies that we have all been saying in our different ways will not be the be all and end all, uh, that it'll take time, the people need to understand that. Phrase, no other alternative. <laughs> Do or die. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank Too you short, so much. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Samarajiva and Dr. Harsha Silva for joining us today. Thank you everyone who's listening in and